preparing this. And, Thank you. Uh, we do appreciate it. Oh, bless you. Really. So I if I can just say a prayer for yes, us. Yes, please. And uh, then we'll make a start. Father, we thank you that where two or three are gathered, you are there in the midst. And so we say we welcome you, Lord Jesus, into our midst and pray for your wisdom and your understanding. And we pray for Liz as she presents the topic this evening, that you'll give her the words to say and uh, fill her with your spirit and with your great love and joy. Amen. 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 Thank you. Good evening. Hello. So... Do, do, I do apologise, I don't know what day of the week it is, except I do know it's Monday because we're here. But there's been a lot going on the last few days. Um, but in the last three weeks, we started off thinking about um, faith and fashion and could we think about those two things. And um, there's a, a gentleman who studies theology and fashion, Robert Covillo, and he says... If as believers we believe the world was created by God, which I do, um, everything in that, there is God to be found in everything. That's not to say um, that every intricate detail of fashion is about faith, but there are things that we can see um, that resonate in um, fashion and clothes as we look at them and um, our Christian faith. And we thought a bit about that at the, on the first one. Then last week we were thinking about the work of Alexander McQueen and thinking about beauty, but also about controversy and pain and um, things that are not so nice and maybe where that sits with us in the Christian faith. Um, just raising some thoughts really. I, I've not the older I get, the more I know, I know less, but I keep, ha I have more questions. But this week is one of my favourite things to think about. So, and I feel like we've got so much that we could cover. I'm just going to do a few things um, as sort of introductory, um, and then I'm going to do some things about how we might um, respond as believers, and, and then also just throw out some ideas of things that we've seen in different churches. This is my personality type. If someone says to me, I've got some good news and some bad news, what do you want first? I will always say bad news, because I want to get that out of the way. So I am going to start with, when we think about sustainability and when we think about the, the planet, um, unfortunately that I'm not going to do all of the bad news, but there is quite a bit of bad news. Water, I believe, clean water, should be a basic human need and should be accessible to all humans on this planet to drink, first and foremost, to bathe in and for the well-being of people. Unfortunately, the fashion industry is having massive um, bearing consequences to the waters of this world in um, the dyeing process in some of the factories, um, the toxic dyes are released into the, the um, rivers, um, so you get whole um, neighbourhoods which have rivers that flow and they go... Uh, what's the colour of the season this year? And they look at the water and they'll tell you what the colour of the season is. Um, and you don't need me to tell you, a lot of those dyes are toxic dyes and they get into the um, irrigation system for their culture of their plants, their animals, the children bathe in it. It's not good. So, so there's, there's all that toxicity. Um, this is someone called Yusuf in 2018. He says, the dyeing and finishing phase of textile fabrics can require as much as 200 litres of water for every tonne of textile produced. According to the United Nations, one pair of jeans takes 7,500 litres of water from the cotton that's grown to the 
ma dyeing, manufacturing and textile process, and then the finishing product to the shop floor. One pair of jeans. Um, and that was August 2021. So there is... And that's the tip of the iceberg, if I'm honest. Um, if we think also about, so that's a bit about the manufacturing process and the dyeing and the way that things are consumed. And uh, uh, on the first time that we gathered together, I spoke about the film that's called The True Cost. There's a really harrowing and very moving, about 15 minutes there, um, talking to a lady who um, has a cotton farm in America. Um, her husband died because the neighbouring farms didn't grow organic cotton. So they were, they're organic farmers. The farmers surrounding them weren't organic and um, it's about the dust and things on his lungs, but he lost his life to that. And so, that, so there are real significant things happening in our world as a result of our love for clothes or our thirst and when I say our, I mean as a nation, as a consumer group, our thirst for more. Um, there are lakes, you'll be aware, there are lakes that have dried up. That There's all sorts of things going on when we think about the, the manufacturing process. And then when we think about um, the life of clothes, sometimes it, ca it can be that they're called wear and throw. So people might wear an outfit once and then throw it away. In fact, and it was a number of years ago now, I remember being on the school playground hearing conversation between a couple of families. Um, one family was going to, um, I don't know, somewhere hot on holiday. And um, their dad said, oh yeah, we, we've, we went to Primark, we got all, all our holiday clothes. And um, someone else went, Oh, but when you go on holiday, you always need to leave space in your suitcase for what you're going to bring back. He said, well, you know, what are you going to do? And he said, oh, well, we'll leave the clothes there. We don't need them. And you just think, seriously? So, the, so that is something within our culture, though, this whole thing of we have, and not, but not everyone does, but there's sometimes there seem to be a net mentality of like, Let's just wear it once, chuck it, wear it and chuck it. Which are, is really not helpful whatsoever when we're thinking about um, us and our world. So, the other thing that is really close to my heart is um, thinking about the people who are producing the clothes and that these people are getting paid a proper wage and being um, working in factories that are, have conditions that are good conditions so that they, their hours are bounded, so that their age is bounded, so that what they do is safe and carefully thought through. But when we think about um, this consumer thing... Um, I think, again, maybe we've become a people in, in Europe and the developing world where we almost like want to appease our own consciences. And it's like, well, I do buy all these clothes, but I give, like, two bags to charity. Um, and that, and there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with us giving clothes to charity. But what, but what we can get into is a cycle of going oh, well, yeah, it's got a few holes and it's a bit tatty, but someone in the developing world will like it. And we give our cast-offs or the rubbish to the people in the developing world who've actually made our clothes in the first place. And that's not right. And just as when we consider food banks and we consider our giving, we're looking to be generous. It's not like, oh, yeah, well, they can have the scrags at the bottom of the of the ten sort of thing, um, so it's. I think what we're looking to do is changing the narrative. And as believers, my heart is 
that we are people who are at the front of that call for change rather than running to catch up with the rest of the good idea of the world. Because I believe in when we read Genesis, what, what do we read? We read God created the world and it was good. And he created the heavens and he created the earth. He created the sun and the moon and the stars. He created the seasons. He created the vegetation, the plants. And again, you know, we were talking about um, the plants on the font. How vibrant they are. What a beautiful colour they are. But we don't simply have yellow roses and blue irises. And I, I know we've got some other plants in there. We have like an extravagance of plants, don't we, in our world. And I believe God as creator sees us as human beings to express that creativity. But also, I believe that as human beings created in the image of God, we're created also in partnership with God. So we're creative beings, but we're there to care for the planet. We're there to look after the planet. So if me buying a cheap pair of jeans is having an effect on the people who make it and the planet, that's not good news. And so as we think about um, how we might um, approach our, our clothes, buying, wearing, living, it, it's, it's as consumers realising this. So I've got this um, in my study at home, which again, I know some people think, well, you shouldn't have got a starfish. Apologies. Yeah, I did get a starfish because it reminds me of um, the story of a man walking along the beach. I know some of you have heard it. And he, as every now and again, he bends down picks something up and he throws it into the sea. He just keeps on doing that. And then someone else comes along and goes, what are you doing? I said to the man, I'm picking up starfish and I'm throwing them back into the sea. The beach is full of them, look. You're never going to throw all of those back into the sea. I said to the man, as he threw a starfish back into the sea, but it'll make a difference for that one. And I think one of the lies that the big companies sell us is, you can't make a difference. What you do doesn't make a difference. It doesn't matter. And that is not true. We can make a difference. And I believe in the whole area of clothes and fabric and buying and treasuring, we can make a difference. And it starts with us. So some of the things that we can... No, I'm not even going to start there. I'll start somewhere else. So, what can we do? I think, um, and again, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir anyway, but I was really struck um, by, when I was younger, I used to look in, um, my mum my and dad shared a wardrobe. My mum had some clothes that were sort of on the side, if that makes sense, which were, as, as a youngster, I thought they were her special clothes. They were her clothes that she wore when she went to special occasions. I also remember we had people round for... My, my mum and dad gave, like, dinner parties. So this was in the eight seventies. So my mum would have long skirts and things. And I loved those clothes. Just looking at them. And then she would have her normal wardrobe, I suppose. But I was struck a few years ago um, thinking, we don't treasure clothes so much. Because those, my, I remember thinking, I'd like those clothes when I get older, not necessarily to wear, but to have so that I can look at them. 
And I was really struck by, as, a, as generations, what have I got to hand down to my daughter? <laughs> because a lot of the stuff is like, I either wear it loads and loads and loads, or I hand it on, or, or I, do, I have got rid of it. And I was, that was quite sad, so I thought, okay, I'm going to start holding on to some things. I think now I'd lo- like to treasure those for my daughter and any grandchildren, that they can have a look and see some of the things that, that we've had and we've used and we've loved as a, almost like a real living history. But it, it's important that we, we treasure things. The other thing that we, we can do is, and again, <laughs> preaching to the choir, get our clothes repaired. So um, Ellie, the other week, she has a pair of um, checked trousers, which she loves, and the zip broke. Now, that was a pair of jeans, and I just thought, you know what, I'm not going to attempt to change that zip. But I took them down into town, and they, got, I got rep- they, they were repaired, and it cost £12. Well, a jean zip isn't, isn't cheap, 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 and I thought for the labour and the thing in that, that was really good. And again, it's... it's thinking, what can I do for those things that I, I like and I treasure? I can get them repaired. It is absolutely fascinating. I've only, I, had, I didn't carry loads of books over with me this week. But th- there's one book that I actually have, I haven't um, got down here, written by um, Anna Murphy, who I think used to write for the, f- um, the fashion column in The Times. And she says this, she says... When you are thinking about clothes, think about who you are, what you do in your days, and therefore what clothes you will need. And then she said this, she said, when you consider the people who are um, quite high up in Harper's Bazaar, Elle, Vogue, these people, you will often see them at fashion shows, wearing similar outfits to the show that they were previously at. Because what these people have worked out is what looks good on them, what works well for them, and they don't follow the fashions. And yet they run the magazines. And so this lady, Anna Murphy, says, so therefore, why don't we, as people, think... What suits me? What am I going to invest in? And what do I need? So, I don't have a wetsuit. <laughs> Not that you would wear that going down the road or anything. Because we don't do anything that I need a wetsuit for. But some of you might. And if it's something that you use a lot, then it's worth investing in that because you're going to use it a lot. When we're thinking about fashion and sustainability, the most sustainable thing we can do is shop our own wardrobe. Not buy anything new. And look at what we've got in our wardrobe already and go, oh, I wonder if this would work with this. And try new things and have a bit of fun. All of these things here um, have been made. I just want to do a bit of rearranging. Let me see if I can do this. So these things here, oh no, hang on. These things here have been made with, I want to say, real fabric. So in other words, that's fabric that I went into a shop and bought it as proper fabric. And so things like, so things like this dress, this fabric was a birthday present because I wanted a, some, for my birthday some nice fabric. So, and this dress is made from what we call dead stock fabric, 
which means that um, big um, corporations who do certain runs of different um, garments end up with what they would call end of rolls. And so there's, um, there's an online shop that does sell, well, there's a lot of online places that sell dead stock, which means that, I suppose I was just being a bit cheeky, I did feel a slightly bit better about buying proper fabric. But this fabric, all of this fabric here, is either curtains or duvet covers or sheets. And, and I, I suppose I put them together because I thought, you can't really tell that much of a difference. So, this skirt, we went um, up to Scotland on holiday and in the service station, <laughs> this is really bizarre, there was a whole box of curtains and it just said, help yourself. I know, I've never been in a service station like that. So I did, and I made a skirt out of that. Um, so this, it, I love this dress. This is a duvet cover. Um, but by being careful with the way that things were cut out, um, I made that dress. So, uh, so it's not as long as I would have wanted because the duvet cover. Um, and the other thing is, so on, with duvet covers, you can, so duvet covers are brilliant because you can get a lot of fabric, and this is, oh, sorry, second-hand duvet covers. You can, but this was only one side with the, that print on and then the other side was that print. So it was a, bit, it was, it was a shame because if it had been the, anyway. But this one here, this was a duvet co cover with um, both sides that print. I'm showing you the front and back. The front and the back of the duvet was um, this fabric. When you, when you can um, spend some time having a go at making your own clothes, what you find is that you can use one pattern for different things. So this, this is like probably upholstery material. So I've took the pattern, the top of the pattern, extended it, and made a jacket. Now I have to say, we are sitting among far, far, far better sews than me. Deb and Ruth, I know you're very, very good sewers. So the ladies at the front, if you have any sewing questions, do ask them. And I'm sure, I know we've got some really good knitters in the house as well. So I'm, again, I'm, I feel like um, I'm in year two and I'm speaking to people who are doing A-levels, but, you know, there we go. Um, this one I brought because this was a white sheet, but I dyed it and then chopped it up and um, made it into a top. So, so again, a, a lot of things... Um, I've shown you that sometimes. Oh, yeah, and then... A lot of things, it's, it's having an eye out. And for me, when I try and now source fabric from charity shops and duvets, I feel like I'm not, I'm not buying a lot of new fabric. I'm trying to keep thing in, things in the loop of it's not going to landfill. I know it's not necessarily going on someone else's bed, but it's being used. So this is my... I, feel a bit of a cheat because I bought this as a quilt from a charity shop and then I cut it up and made a jacket of it. So those of you who watched Sewing Bee, sorry, this is a bit of a spoiler, but they had to make their own quilt fabric. I did not do that. But I might have a go because that's um, inspired me. So sometimes by um, learning um, to make things, and please hear me, I know some people are uh, more time poor than I might be. Um, but what I've found is that by, by making clothes, and again, I know I've said this, but I'm alerted to the fact, oh, it's really hard to make clothes. It, it's really time consuming. So again, forgive me, sewing bee, give people four and a quarter hours to make a dress. 
I made a dress the other day. It took me an hour to put the sleeves in. Like, so I would not have passed that. But I'm not making it to, like, rush. I'm, I think another benefit for me of making things is I feel like um, it gives me opportunity to do something that I like doing. And again, being made in the image of a creative God, I think that's, that's really important. I, and I like doing it. Um, so, so we can have fun with the wardrobe that we've got already. But you might say, I do need something new. What do I do? We could ask someone who's similar in size to us if we could borrow something. If it's for a, for a one-off occasion, we could ask to borrow something. We could look in um, a charity shop because, again, you can get amazing, amazing bargains from a charity shop. Or we could have a go at getting an old sheet and making something or, or saying to someone, I'd like to have a go, could you, could you help me um, make that? There are lots of options, but when it comes to possibly needing to buy something, I would suggest... I'm going to show some things that I found will help me. As with, what they say with food shopping, don't go shopping when you're hungry. Because <laughs> you buy like, oh no, I buy far too much and like want to devour it as soon as I've got out of the shop. Don't go shopping when you're either going, oh, I just need to lift my mood, so I'm just going to buy a little something. Or, oh, I have to get something. But do a bit of sort of, preparation before you go I think I think that's again another thing that the advertisers don't want us to do but we're in control and so think what do I need what's it going to work well with so, so you see that's a de- one of my downfalls is my prints <laughs> are too loud in some ways so I can't put a lot of those things together or maybe I just do and go, I'm sorry, everyone. Do you know what? That's what it is. Um, think, think what you, so think what you need. Um, and um, a number of people will say, think the 30 wears. So if you're going to buy something new, will you wear that 30 times? There are some places that are really, really um, helpful to buy from. So this place here, this lady is from a place called Community Clothing, which is based in Bradford. And if you do watch The Sewing Bee, Patrick, I don't know his surname, sorry. It's not not that I've met him at all. But he um, heads up this place called Community Clothing. Um, And it does um, jeans, and it does Breton tops, it does sweatshirts, T-shirts, things like that. And they use um, the people in the local area in Bradford to make the clothes and they're also looking to grow their own flax and looking to try and start some um, production of their own fabrics as well but he is very much for um, the heritage of our land that we used to be a nation where we made fabric and we our textile industry was amazing and he he wants that um, a back, I suppose, for want of a better word. Patrick of Grant. Grant, thank you. Um, there's a shop in Exeter, if I know some of you have been down to Devon recently, but there's a shop in Exeter called Sancho's that has um, fairly traded and thoughtfully bought um, clothes as well as um, household items. All the People there are wearing dungarees from a company called Lucy and Yak, which is online, and that is um, favoured by some in our congregation. Um, but that is, if you've got teenagers 
who might want to wear dungarees or some slightly outlandish trousers or um, t-shirts. Um, they do a mix of sizes, um, predominantly for girls, I would, su I would suggest, but they're not exclusively. Um, but they are a company, they are online, Sancho's. Um, this lady, Kemi Telford, she um, uses a lot of um, African wax print fabrics in her products. She's, she's just got some of her dresses and skirts into John Lewis. So she's a lady who, um, Kemi Telford, she will be online. But if you want to see some, she's got a small run of clothes in John Lewis. Um, and she, again on her website, so they, I think she does sizes like small, medium, large, they put the measurements, a lot of her things are elasticated at the waist, but she will say, measure yourself carefully before you put an order in, um, because they do a certain run of things and she doesn't really want people to return things. Who else have we got? So down here, um, I've a few um, weeks ago, we also talked about an app called Good On You, which will tell you about the rating of shops. Um, if you again, it's being prepared when you when you go out. So I went onto that um, app, and they had um, well, actually they had I think twenty one or thirty one. Um, ethical and sustainable clothing brands from the UK. Um, there's not 21 or 31 there, I can't remember what she said, because I needed to just use two sides of paper. And some of them I looked at and thought, oh, that's quite expensive. Some of them still are quite expensive. But um, there's some accessories. There's also a, a company called Elvis and Crease, which um, are near Sittingbourne, where we used to live, and they make bags from um, fire hoses. Um, so there's eyewear, there's baby clothes, there's underwear, um, there's menswear, um, there's all sorts of things. Yeah, and there is Stella McCartney, lovely, but I could not afford that. Um, and I've also put Kemi Telford and Community clothing and there's another um, small brand based in Bow down in London Aesthetic Laundry and they do a lot of t-shirts things with um, t-shirt material t-shirts hoodies sweatshirt bottoms um, colorful things um, so again possibly aimed at a younger market although that makes me laugh because I've got one of their tops so there you go so, um, if we are thinking of buying things new, there's a lot that we can do to, to use our money well and to put our money into things that are um, sustainable, thoughtful. Small businesses, local businesses, um, doing our homework before we, before we go out, I think makes a massive, massive difference. But what I want to... Um, finish on and I'm sorry I know there's high street stuff in some ways that we haven't um, thought about is coming back to this whole thing of um, how as believers we are wow oh, isn't that you know just co-workers in this world with God and so I just want to share with you some things that I believe as, as Christians, actually we are so strategically and so well placed to do some of these things. And I know that some of you have done some of these things here. But how could we, as a group of believers, maybe do our bit not only with shopping and by ourselves, but collectively so that we make a difference. Well, there are three things. So one, and I know you've done this, is, is clothes swaps, where we have um, some clothing rails, where we say to people, it's happening at such and such time, we'd love you to come, maybe bring along two or three 
items in good condition, that you are happy, and again, so I've done it where we've raised money, I've done it where we haven't, but, but effectively where you hand your one or two or three items, they get put up on rails, and again, either all skirts, all jackets, all trousers, all shirts, we sort it out so it looks really nice. We have good quality refreshments. We have nice lighting and people come, they we chat and we talk and we are the body of Christ. We swap clothes and it's on the understanding again. We've done it in different ways. When I've done it, we've said if you're you're welcome to take home what you brought if it doesn't get swapped or leave it and what we do is we take it to a local charity shop so they get blessed with good quality garments. And for me, that is an amazing opportunity to invite people I might meet on the school playground because I'm inviting them to something that I feel is non-threatening, something that's low-key, something that's social, something that's really, really good. Um, and we get our church full and, you know, the conversation I've had and, and where we were before, we knew that there were some people who couldn't afford, sometimes we'd said it's a pound an item, or if we've got designer things, we would put maybe five pounds, ten pounds on it. But there were some people who couldn't and we just go, no, you'll take that for your daughter, but tell her that it came from church. And so that just, it, it sets an agenda that we, we have fun, we do things and we enjoy doing that together. But what we're looking to do is we're looking to say, yeah, how can we as the body of Christ come together and how can we think about what we do with our clothes and how can other people enjoy what maybe I've had some enjoyment from but I want to pass on. And, um, and then the hilarious thing is, if you do that regularly, so we started doing that about three times a year, but over the course of a number of years, you'd see sometimes different things coming back and other people taking it home. So it made church on Sunday hilarious because sometimes you'd see some, someone in something and you think, oh, that... Oh, no, it's not. It's someone else. Um, but it's really, it, it helps in uh, thinking carefully um, and sharing what we have. Another thing that we've done is a fashion afternoon. So um, I'm really sorry, those photos aren't brilliant. But on the right-hand side is some publicity. Don't look too close at that comms person. <laughs> Um, some publicity and then um, just we were a church that had um, wooden pews but they'd been removed but we had to keep some so the pictures show um, some of the pews so we had accessories we had donations for the fashion show um, so we, we ran it as like a clothes swap but with bells and whistles sort of thing. So we had a clothes swap, so people donated clothes. We had people from the church who said that they would model, um, and so people who were modelling were able to go and pick things that they wanted to model. And we had a number of... We had about 10... 10 catwalk... Just to see... You can know that I don't do fashion that much. 10 songs and different... Um, Beach wear, holiday wear, coats, ties, shirts and stuff. We had such fun. But we also got a sixth form college to come in and they, we had a display of some of the work, the quilting work that they'd done. We had some people in our church who um, made jewellery. So some people, were, were they were there with a, a table. We had other people who um, had done some of their own T-shirts um, we had people who uh, made bags. So we had lots of different things going on. And then, we, again, we had good quality refreshments. But it was such fun. And we had two fashion shows. And it was really, really good to, again, raise the profile of where we were, get people in. Because, again, if you get people in from the local school for displays, parents come in and see... And it was good fun. We got ourselves in the papers for a good reason. 
that was a really, really good thing. And I'm nearly out of time, but this final... Oh, actually, I've got loads of pictures. So that was the catwalk. And um, that's showing it from one angle. Um, that was an accessories corner. That was the, oh, right, and then this is what I want to say. This is the final thing that I want to say. And you'll have to forgive me, because this makes me feel a bit emotional. I still believe... so. Just before 2020, I was thinking about clothes swaps and clothes and fashion, and I've spoken a bit about my second curacy and what we could do. And um, a, long, a long, long time ago, so my first ever proper paid job was in teaching, and I loved the September start. I loved the getting the new stationery, getting the new... Um, Pens, getting, getting new things for September. And um, I was, so maybe it was just, it was quite before 2020, but maybe it was that September, just thinking of the children going back to school and, and that rhythm and thinking, oh goodness. And then, you know, if you do go into different shops, you see on the front of magazines, oh, the autumns must have this, that and the other. And I was thinking... Is part of my problem, and maybe other people's, the whole thing about, but I want something new? And is it that I want something new, and then after a couple of wears, it's like lost its shyness, so I want something new again? So I did, like, I was thinking about that, I was thinking, yeah, but, but what is the answer? Because I don't want to keep going to a second-hand shop to get new stuff, because... That's not what I'm looking at, looking for. And then actually, if I'm honest, I believe, I still believe God gave me this thing. But I have this idea about a wardrobe library. Where instead of borrowing books, clothes can be borrowed. And so what I set out, and this is my study in um, sitting Point, is... Um, I'll go back to that one. The, the idea we had, and we worked from the September to the Christmas, really. People in church don't, donated to the library one or two items. And, and the requirement was this. They do need to be in good condition, and you do need to be willing to give them so that people can borrow them. We went through a whole load of things. Is, does it cost? da 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 and in the end, we thought, no, because we wanted to be a place where whatever walk of life you came from, you could come and borrow clothes. And the thing was, so you could borrow, say, about, say four items of clothes for two weeks. And then you would bring them back and you got the option of either like taking them out again for another two weeks or changing it for something else. And the, whole idea, and the whole idea was that this works with everyday wear because, again, it's like, well, I've got something different I can wear for two weeks and then I can go and get something else. No money has changed hands. No one's gone and bought anything new, but what we've done is shared. And my prayer was that this would start in January 2020, 2020 and that we would have established that by the May we would have been in partnership with the secondary schools and we'd say, you've got a prom night? Fantastic. We have got two rails of prom dresses. The girls don't need to go and buy a dress. And we will even do individual consultations where no one else knows you're coming to our house. And then they can borrow it and bring it back. Well, we all know what happened, don't we? But I still, I, I really do believe that um, I still think this has got legs. So what, so what happened is that the first one was in my study, I'd have these rails of clothes and then some, um, a room divider because I did need to work in my study, but my space was getting a bit cramped out. And then a couple of days a week, I'd, everything would be got out so people could come and browse and so this is this was this sort of opening night 
So coats there. We even have people lend shoes. So it, and there are some of the ball, well, prom dresses there. Oh, that's it. So I don't know. I throw those things out to say, let's as a community think creatively about what we could do because there is so much that we could do. Um, and, and let's be crazy together. Let's think of some crazy things that we could do so that we can have fun, so we can build community, so that we can be good news and so that we can care for this amazing world that God has given us. Apologies, I've spoken too long. Are you happy to take questions? Yes. I'm happy <laughs> to take them. Um, can I ask you, if you'd like to ask Liz a question, if you could just raise your hand and I'll pass you the microphone because the, the session is being recorded. Um, anybody like to start off? Jen. There are, other, there are other types of clothes um, that you haven't mentioned. Things like sportswear and um, there's that firm, I, I, I told you about, there's a firm called Paramo, which um, sell clothes that are ethically made in that they uh, pay the um, people a living wage and they're made in Ecuador, I think, mm -hmm. actually. Um, and, and Sorry? Columbia, John tells me, yeah. So for people who do things like canoeing and walking and stuff like that, I, we'd really recommend them. So that's not really a question, it's more of a... No, that's great. Thing. And there are some on the sheet oh, down sure. here. Um, but it was so interesting what you said about Bradford as well, because we lived in Bradford and we didn't know anything about that company. It's so. quite... In, it's, it's in the last five years. Ah, think, right. So okay. it's, it's not an, a long-established thing. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. Anybody else? Have you carefully avoided saying anything about men's fashion, Liz? Can I just... Do you, want, do you want to take two minutes and come up with a thought about men's fashion? Whether you think it's, it's a different world? Well, it isn't a different world really, is it? In that um, this, the parameters still apply in um, us being created in the image of God, mm. creative beings, and, and we have the choice of how we um, respond to being stewards of the planet, so mm. taking care of our, our clothes. And, and I think, you know, again, it, it's really what I'm encouraged in. And sorry, I, I probably didn't explain enough, but there is some menswear things on there as well. Mm -hmm. I think that that game is being upped. And it also does remind me, um, like, can you remember we said that in some respects, men's fashion is the fount of where all of our, fash our female fashion today has come from. It's, all, it's rooted in... Men's, men's clothes. Um, so, it's, again, we, we talked about high heels, didn't we? That, that came from the men's riding shoe. So, you are, you are the, the forerunners of, of what we've been able to pick up. Um, but, yeah, please don't ask me to try and make a shirt because that would take me like six years probably it would take me ages but i think but i think it's important actually that all, all joking aside that men feel that able to um think about what they're wearing if if that's something that enables them to feel yeah this this is who i am and again it's like dress to express who we are mm. rather than impress you know, and, and be in a show-off way, but to express who we are in, in, in the eyes of God. I was going to say something else, and I go, oh, yes. 
I've written right at the top of my notes. It shows where I should have read this. Because we, we talked about this being, Ruth, I will come to you in a minute, is green the new black? And just saying that it does seem to be that in, in fashion circles, some, the whole sustainability thing and the whole green thing, we, we, you know, is that's being used to push um, um, fashion. So it is worth being thoughtful in our purchases because, again, some big companies are saying, oh, yes, this has been made a bit more carefully. And that's true, and it has, but it's that one garment and then there's like a whole shop floor of other stuff that maybe wasn't so thoughtfully made. So, it is, you know, again, it, it's doing our homework and thinking carefully about, about that. Ruth? Yeah, going back to this idea of um, what we do with our clothes when we finish with them, because there is, it's like everything in the Western world, isn't it? We offload our rubbish to the developing world to, to do something with. And I think it is true to say that a lot of Western stuff or the stuff that the charity shops can't sell, eventually it finds its way onto the markets in Africa and other places. And what it does there is, because it, it's seen as more trendy to wear even old, second-hand European clothes, um, it actually ruins all the local yes. industry, mm. the, the local seamstresses mm. making clothes out of local cloth. Um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of, it's so far reaching, isn't it? Mm. That we have to think all the time. It's not just a question of, well, I'm going to give it to a charity shop, so that's okay. Because it's not very okay. It recycles mm. it, but yeah. Mm. It's just such an enormous problem, isn't it? Mm. We just have too many clothes. Yes. We have too much stuff. Yes, we do. And then we have to get rid of the stuff we've we finished with. Yeah. A bit depressing, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 that's where we are and where we we can again we can I do believe we can make a difference. I have a question for Liz or anybody else. So I help the a local primary school recycle their second hand uniform and we just give it back out to anyone we don't charge for it. We just want to see it reused because the amount of school uniform yeah. that these parents buy and then the kid leaves it on the playground with no name on it and you wouldn't believe how many piles of school uniform I have. But when it gets damaged and stained, I'm left with piles and piles of school uniform and I, I don't know what to do with it, really. I don't know if anyone has any ideas on what I can do with it. Because it's got logos, you can't give it to charity shops and it's damaged, That's, which is kind of piggybacking on... And what you were just saying is what we do with the stuff when you can't wear it anymore. Well, what, again, it's like sometimes we, it, we can feel it's quite time consuming, but so, that, so there's a place in, again, it's, it's not here, but in Sweden where they will um, take um, jeans that are damaged and, like, and they actually pulp them down. Uh, it's far, far more difficult than I'm explaining. But, but they, they make, from the old jeans, they actually do make new denim material that can be ma made. So praying that we as a country get more able to do that. But maybe there is something in if, if there's part of the garment that is savable, we go, okay, we're going to do some quilting. So we, we sort out the cotton, which is easier to quilt than anything else, and start cutting stuff up and maybe doing, using it that way. But that's a really good thing. And I think maybe collectively, if we, between ourselves, we can think, is there something that we could do to use those things for... Um, Ruth's got an idea. I think it, we can think about the small things as well. So I've got three boys, so I would sew up trousers. You know, they'd always be splitting the crotch because they had the bumster look in the 90s. So I would mend those. I would tell them to sew their own buttons on. So there's those small things. 
And there's things like using it for cushion stuffing, because often they make cushions, don't they, at primary school, and just, just thinking about it. So I think it's about the small. And for me, it's like, you know, washing your clothes at a lower temperature, using them, yes. using them more. I don't necessarily, you know, we don't wash stuff when we've worn it once, and educating kids to do that as well. Yes. So there's lots of small steps, Yes, I definitely. Think. Yes, Ruth, you're genius, because that's a whole raft I left from my notes. Yeah, it is. It's, it's again, we don't need to wash our clothes as much as we do. And, in fact, you don't need to wash your jeans. Put them in the freezer. <laughs> Put them in the freezer for 12 hours. I would suggest you let them defrost before you put the one again. <laughs> or, um, like, when it's nice weather, you can air them, but you don't need to wash jeans. Um, and the other thing is, and again, I've got much, much, much better at this. Like, if you get a little mark on you, don't, like, put the whole thing in the what You can spot clean. I mean, again, you know these things. I remember I used to work on a caravan site, and we, we worked in the, the <laughs> chippy. Oh, and um, our clothes really stank. But what we would do is like just hang them up by the window and then <laughs> wear them the next day, you know, but it didn't harm us really. Just fine. Um, sometimes the charity shops have, they'll collect shoddy. So any, anything that's rubbish, they will collect. They, obviously, somebody's got to assess if it's worth that it can be recycled. But that's what they, they've always done. Yes, they, you, you are right. Um, so I, d I did a bit of volunteering in a charity shop, and so sometimes they'll take um, blankets, and they'll have blankets for, like, dog blankets or, mm. or towels. Um, and that is, a, that is really true. But I also know that the volume of things given to charity shops has increased. And sometimes, unfortunately, that volume is bigger in the, the what we would call go to rags and they get money for the rags. Um, and then it, it does come back a bit to what Ruth was saying in that these things are shipped off so it's not our problem, but you are right. Um, it is. It, they, our charity shop sector, do amazing work. But I, and and I would never not want to have charity shops. But I think again, as consumers, it's us just thinking more carefully about um, what we buy and cutting, you know, buy less, so that we still are able to give to charity shops. But it's not maybe the hundred of bags, but just a couple of bags, so that they can cope with more of the, the quantity that's being given to them, if that makes sense. So they've got their goods to sell on and their rags, but they're not overwhelmed, because sometimes it can just be a real glut of stuff. Deb, do you need a microphone? Um, I had... A conversation with the gentleman who collects the textile recycling at the tip about three weeks ago and he told me that the whole system is completely saturated so now what he does is he opens that big container and he sorts it into things that are wearable clothes and things that are not and anything that's not he puts in the rubbish bin the landfill or the incineration pile or whatever and I just stood there crying with my bag full of clean fabric scraps because we think, don't we, that we can, we think we can solve it. We think we can find an answer to our excess. And um, we can't, the answer to our excess is, is not to want or need those things so much. And, and it's, that's really hard, especially I have my mum of two teenage girls and a teenage boy. And they, the big one will thrift. She's fantastic. She goes and she's, if you get, actually, if you give all of them a fiver and send them to the charity shops, they think that's like the best day out ever. <laughs> so, so they have learned that well. But the middle-sized one loves, you know, ASOS, Primark, all of those kind of, you know, mm. and then it all gets piled on the floor in every keep. And they've been brought up all the same way, and yet she doesn't cherish her mm. clothes mm. at all. It's all, yeah, it's all so hard, really hard. But I just thought, you know, we... we we trust that we're kind of doing the 
the best thing that we can do and I suppose that's that's all we can do. Mm -hmm. I work a bit at the clothes bank as well. And what you see there is that um, people bring huge, huge quantities of things in variable states of um, cleanliness, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. lack of repair, mm -hmm. some very beautiful things. But the people who bring are not bringing the things that the people who come need, need to take. So we have a lot of things that are um, older gentlemen's because people have died. So a lot of kind of people bring all of people's wardrobes, the whole thing. Um, and yet, when you've got somebody who's in their 20s, who's, you know, got interesting backstories, that's not what they're after. They need, a, like, a hoodie, mm. a pair of joggers, a pair of jeans, a good fairy fitting pair of shoes. And, and so, although we feel like we're doing the right thing when we're giving those things, actually, there's a mismatch there between what we've got and what we can offer that people need in mm. that circumstance. Mm. I don't know, sometimes it feels like we're just putting a big fat stick in plaster over something that's not quite, we're not quite looking deep mm. enough into it. I, think. Mm. I absolutely agree. I do, and I think, you know, I think um, collectively, we as people of faith, it starts with us, <laughs> us reflecting and looking where we are. But I want to end on a high. And like Ruth says, we can make a difference like in those small things. Because all those small things add up. And if collectively each of us do small things, that again has a cumulative effect. And that I pray, that's what I'm praying for, contagious holiness, contagious small things that make a difference, that be, bring about that change. One last question before we finish. <clears throat> In which case, it's just uh, please admit to me to uh, to say thank you again, Liz. Thank you. We've had a most enjoyable and interesting evening, and uh, perhaps we should show our appreciation in the usual way. Thank you. Uh, just to say that. <coughs> As you know, as a BRIC committee, we try and 